In 1958, during the summertime, President Eisenhower made a special order for the world's first nuclear-powered submarine, the Nautilus. This top-secret mission known as Operation Sunshine aimed to show that submarines could travel anywhere and pose a real nuclear threat. However, this journey under the northern ice cap led to unexpected challenges. So why aren't there many cargo submarines today? Dive with us beneath the sea as we uncover the untold story of the cargo submarine era that never arrived. Welcome to Superstructures! The idea of transporting goods beneath the sea wasn't new. Almost 45 years before, during World War I, concepts for cargo submarines were considered. Germany, needing raw materials to win the war, faced a challenge due to the British blockade. To overcome this, they planned to use U-boats without torpedoes, filled with cargo, to go to the neutral United States and buy the needed materials. However, there were two problems. The trip had to be profitable, and the sinking of a ship carrying Americans in 1917 led to the U.S. joining England and France, closing trade with Germany. In the next war, the role reversed. The U.S. Navy took the lead in deploying cargo-carrying submarines strategically. During the early stages of the Japanese occupation of the Philippines in 1942, U.S. submarines carried ammunition and supplies to Corregidor Island in Manila Bay. These submarines played a crucial role in evacuating the wounded, nurses, and gold as the Japanese advanced. To maximize cargo capacity, torpedoes and ammo were removed. The success of this strategic withdrawal prompted President Franklin D. Roosevelt to instruct the Navy to develop cargo-carrying submarines. Although three Barracuda-class submarines were built, they were never used extensively, as conventional boats were deemed more effective. Interestingly, it was the Axis powers that made more use of cargo submarines during this period. To support the extensive Nazi U-boat fleet, special cargo U-boats were converted, known as the Type 14. These submarines were designed to refuel attacking U-boats capable of carrying 500 tons of fuel and other materials. Each Type 14 could supply up to 12 U-boats for 4 to 8 weeks. Initially successful, the plan faced a setback when the Allies decoded the cluster of 12 U-boats at one location, leading to the destruction of all resupply submarines. The Germans then attempted to design the Type 20 cargo submarine, with a surface displacement of 2,700 tons, an 800-ton cargo capacity, and the ability to carry 50 tons externally in special bags. Devoid of torpedoes, it featured anti-aircraft cannons for self-defense during resupply. Initially tasked with bringing supplies from Germany's eastern ally, this mission was abandoned to prioritize materials for building more attack submarines. In the Pacific, the Japanese also utilized cargo submarines to resupply their island bases during the Allied blockade, even transporting launchable aircraft. In World War II, submarines played a dominant and fearsome role. The Land Lease Program, crucial for rescuing Britain and Russia from the Nazis, relied on American-made weapons and goods transported by the merchant fleet. However, German U-boats in the icy Atlantic constantly harassed this fleet. To counter this threat, some British individuals proposed an unconventional idea. Why not use submarines to transport goods instead of ships? Britain's geographical advantage of being an island surrounded by the sea turned out to be a vulnerability. The dependence on shipping or seaplanes for goods made them susceptible to being surrounded and cut off from North America and Europe. The proposed solution was cargo submarines. After the war, Barnes Wallace, known for inventing the Vicar Swallow and the famous Dam Busters bomb, championed nuclear-powered cargo submarines. He believed this approach would make Britain immune to future embargoes and elevate it to a global trading power. Unfortunately, his vision for a robust Britain faced resistance as the empire underwent internal dismantling. Guess who didn't abandon this idea? None other than our favorite, Soviet Union. In the 1990s, the Malakit Design Bureau in St. Petersburg put forth a proposal for submarines designed to transport petroleum or freight containers within or through Arctic regions. The concept evolved these submarines submerging beneath the polar ice cap to navigate directly between ports in Europe and Asia, and potentially northern Canada. The designers highlighted that given equal cargo capacity, the efficiency of an underwater container ship is considerably higher, for example, than that of an icebreaker transport ship of the Norilsk type. An underwater container is competitive. The tanker and container variants were designed to mirror standard military nuclear submarines. 
the tanker version can carry around 30,000 tons of petroleum, loadable and dischargeable from surface or underwater terminals. The container carrier was intended to transport 912 standard freight containers, loaded within 30 hours through hatches aided by an internal conveyance system. Unfortunately, these plans were abandoned due to the challenging financial conditions following the dissolution of the Soviet Union. In a parallel development, General Dynamics in the 1980s explored the idea of submarine tankers. They designed two versions, a $725 million nuclear-powered ship and a $700 million version powered by methane. A similar design was proposed later by the Rubin Central Design Bureau, envisioning a submarine cargo vessel as a civilian adaptation of the iconic Typhoon-class submarine from the Cold War. Although a submarine freight transport system was suggested in 1997, serving as a seagoing component of the Global Intelligent Transportation System, the idea never materialized. Today, Russia, facing various military needs, never implemented the plan to retrofit old submarines for cargo transport. So the big question remains, why don't we have cargo submarines today and why does the concept consistently face challenges? The fundamental truth is that submarines don't make much commercial sense beyond military or illicit uses. The reality is that transporting goods on large surface ships is incredibly cost-effective. Boat technology, which has been in use for tens of thousands of years, is highly mature. And with containerization, it has reached unprecedented levels of globalization. Submarines, however, are expensive to build and maintain and lack efficiency compared to boats because they displace more water per unit of cargo. Submarines have to allocate significant space to ballast tanks for diving and resurfacing, reducing the cargo space. Cargo companies wouldn't invest in submarines with limited cargo room and costly technology. Without the efficiency of nuclear power, which is more common in military subs, submarines become less practical and more expensive than boats. Opting for large surface ships insured against storms and utilizing canals proves to be a more economical choice. And there you have it, the intriguing journey into the depths of cargo submarines. From historical attempts to modern-day considerations, it's clear that while submarines have a powerful presence beneath the waves, their role in commercial cargo transport remains challenging. If you found this exploration interesting, don't forget to dive into more captivating topics on superstructures. Hit that subscribe button, like this video, and share your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the wonders of engineering and technology with us.